from the world of politics. Frankly, I'm kind of tired of the Russia telling us what is provocative when they're slamming artillery shells into residential buildings. To the world of business. To try to avoid a situation where inflation becomes so high or so entrenched that the only way to root it out is, is by sort of engineering uh, a recession. This is Balance of Power with David Weston. From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our television and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. We start at the White House once again today. And the story, of course, is Ukraine, but this time by way of China, with news that President Biden is due to speak with President Xi of China tomorrow about Ukraine. And to get the latest, we welcome now our Washington correspondent, Joe Matthew, who's host of Sound On weekdays every day of the week on Bloomberg Radio. So, Joe, thanks for being with us. What do we know about this conversation? Is this because they're close to having an agreement on what to do, or... President Biden has to talk him into something. It might be more the latter, David. These two leaders will speak tomorrow. We've learned in the morning hours, Washington, D.C. time, in what will be their first call since November. And it comes on the heels of a meeting at the start of this week in Rome between National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and China's top diplomat as the U.S. tries to put pressure on China to steer it away from helping Russia in this war in Ukraine. The messaging, David, from Beijing has evolved quite a bit since the start of this invasion. Before Russia crossed the border, before the shelling began, China was almost giving tacit approval to this military operation, going so far as to say that the U.S. was inflaming tensions and that Russia's security concerns needed to be acknowledged. It started to change a lot, though, once Russia began this invasion, with China condemning the killing of civilians. And just yesterday, China's envoy to Ukraine told the mayor of Lviv, David, quote, a friendly country. China is a friendly country for the Ukrainian people, he said, and China would never attack Ukraine. Now, the official line we got from the White House, Press Secretary Jen Psaki saying that the conversation tomorrow, they'll discuss managing the competition, she said, between our two countries, as well as Russia's war against Ukraine. But this is far from a routine conversation, David. There's a lot to discuss here as the U.S. threatens severe consequences against China if it helps Russia continue this war effort in Ukraine. The White House has never identified exactly what those consequences are, but it is, of course, widely known that China needs trading partners like the U.S to remain viable. David? I'm so glad you mentioned what Jen Psaki had to say, because as you say, there's a lot to discuss. There's also a lot on President Xi's agenda. It's not just yeah. Ukraine that he's got to deal with. He's got a COVID-19 problem with lockdowns, whatever we call them, going on in China. He's got an economy that is slowing down, apparently. He's got problems with the stock market. So he has a lot on his agenda. I wonder if he might get some help, actually, from President Biden in exchange for something on Ukraine. It's a great way that you put that, David, because it's not just the U.S. trying to keep China from supporting Russia in this in this war, but hoping that possibly Beijing could play a role in bringing this war to an end. To your point, Beijing has a lot to lose and potentially gain in this conversation tomorrow. So it's one that we'll be watching closely. Thank you so much for being there to watch it for us. That's Joe Matthew. He is our Washington correspondent. Also, he is the host every day of the week on Sound On. That's at 5 p.m. Eastern time on Bloomberg Radio. And now we're going to go to the other big story that is pending right now in Washington, and that is, of course, the Fed and the economy. Welcome now, Catherine Edwards. She's Rand Corporation economist and Pardee Rand graduate school professor. So, Professor, thanks so much for being with us. We heard from the Fed yesterday. I wonder what your reaction was to what we heard. They're raising rates. We expect them to do this. But what about their projections? going out. They are committing to achieving a soft landing, which is what they call it when they raise interest rates without hopefully increasing unemployment. And that's what they've projected that they're going to do. That's certainly what they're projected. And that sounds like a nice story. How believable is it to you as an economist? Because just looking at these economic projections, and I'm no economist, to the notion that they're going to raise rates, we're going to have more inflation than they thought we were going to have, we're going to slow down growth. And by the way, unemployment will be the same. I know you're a specialist in unemployment. Is that plausible? We are in so many ways in uncharted territory. We are still in a pandemic, whether we like that or not. And we have the world's third largest oil producer uh, under incredibly historic sanctions. And so how much it's able to pull off is really a question of how much is truly under their control and is manipulable by their own policy. What strikes me as so incredible about what's happening with interest rates and their projections is that we still have you know, more than a million fewer jobs than we did before the pandemic 
started. The unemployment rate is lower, but by many metrics, we would not say our labor market is recovered, especially for the more than 1 million women who have not returned. By traditional methods of economic analysis, is it possible to slow down the economy, which clearly they need to do because of the inflation issue, without giving up some jobs on the way? It has happened before when, the peer, when there is full employment. It's just a matter of if those conditions can be met. What I worry about is the number of workers that are still sidelined and if the unemployment rates, which of course is only counts people who are actively looking for work, is truly a, the right metric of slack in our labor market at this moment. Now, the latest estimates are that at least a half a million workers are sidelined at the moment because of lack of access to childcare. They wouldn't necessarily show up as unemployed, but that doesn't mean that the demand for jobs in our labor market is met. How to interpret this relative to the unemployment rate is, I think, very difficult, but it's definitely a concern. I mean, when we when we had full employment at the uh, end of the 2019, kind of early 2020, we also had much higher labor force participation of both, um, among both men and women. Is it possible, Professor, that in fact, we don't realize how tight the labor market is? I mean, one way perhaps to make sense out of what the Fed numbers are is actually it's much tighter than we thought, so they can actually tighten down on the economy and financial conditions without really losing a lot of jobs. Yes, but of course it can always go the other way and it's much looser than we thought as well. You know, a lot of the jobs that are being created, a lot of the quits that we're seeing, they're very much concentrated in the high turnover, low wage industries. And there's, you know, as much evidence as there is that workers or that employers are having a hard time finding jobs and finding uh, workers to fill those jobs. We also are seeing evidence that workers are having a hard time getting sufficient hours even after they're hired. And so the, just the number of jobs and the number of people doesn't really give any dimension to quality and the slackness that can happen for a lot of workers on the job. I mean, most of the growth has come from the low wage service sector, which even when the economy is running hot, more than half of workers tend to say they don't have as much hours as they'd like. I wonder about the projections from the Fed in another respect. I mean, they basically said that they think inflation is about 4.3 percent, a lot higher than before. There are quite a few surveys, including from Evercore ISI, that say it's closer to 5.5 percent. It's higher than they thought. At the same time, they said that they'll be up to about 2.25 percent on the on the Fed run funds rate by the end of 23. Some people on the Fed thought it would be three and a quarter percent. Do we need something higher than 2.25 percent to control inflation if it is at 4.3, much less 5.5 percent? I think that depends on whether or not you think the mission right now is to control inflation or control inflationary expectations. Definitely the Fed moving in this direction you know, likely accomplishes the, the latter. But I, I hesitate to commit even a year in advance if I think about where we were a year ago to say this is what needs to happen by the end of 2022 or by the end of 2023. I think the most important is for the Fed to stay nimble in a situation that is evolving so quickly for workers, for consumers, and then for our country as you know, the bombings in Ukraine continue. And Chair Powell has said he wants to be nimble. I think he's used exactly that word. And goodness knows that sounds like a good thing. And it's easy for somebody like me outside, not in the process, to second guess what's going on. At the same time, if you look back at their, the, the system they adopted in August of 2020 to try to run hot on inflation, it was the wrong time. And yet, do they realize they made a mistake? Have they given us a new plan that will really give us some sense of assurance that they're in command now of where we are? You know, I do think that calls like mistake really are a luxury of point of view. I mean, for the tens of millions of workers that lost their job in April of 2020 and who needed aggressive action in order to get their, their jobs and their families and their finances secure, it wouldn't really be fair to call it a mistake that we acted faster and we acted larger than we have in past recessions to salvage our labor market and not go through just the years of pain it took to cover recover from the Great Recession. So I think... You know, mistake is, is easy to apply when you consider one dimension, but we there are always trade-offs to policy, whether it's coming from Fed or Congress. And at this moment, it's less so did they make a mistake and more so is it time to consider the trade-offs to what they have done. I mean, we have recovered from a truly devastating recession. It could have been worse than the Great Depression. And yet instead, we saw the fastest job growth in a year and a half. That has its own consequences, but that directly affects millions of American workers and millions of American families. 
And it's it's not necessarily for us to say that that was a mistake, considering we've erred on the other side for the past three recessions before this. Professor, that was a really good point, that calling it a mistake is a luxury of a point of view, as I think what you said. I'm going to remember that. That's really apt. Thank you so much to Catherine Edwards from RAND. Coming up, more on the market reaction to yesterday's Fed decision. That's still ahead. And this is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. There's been a lot going on in the world to potentially affect the markets, not least of which was the Fed decision and those projections from yesterday. Here to bring us up to speed on where the markets are today, right now, here's Kriti Gupta. Kriti? Yeah, David, it's interesting. We are seeing the stock market just a little bit higher, actually, which is interesting because we've had weeks and weeks of selling, and we did see that pretty strong bounce back the last couple of days. So the question is, how long can that bounce back go? And yet you see a lot of these stock bulls, they are very much buying despite that extremely hawkish pivot from the Fed yesterday. And it kind of seems like it's this idea that maybe we're in the clear when it comes to a commodity shock. Maybe we're in the clear when it comes to a lot of that recession talk that we were going in or seeing going into uh, Chairman Powell's meeting yesterday, but also keep in mind, even in the face of Brent crude rising to 106, WTI at $102 a barrel, you are still seeing a positive stock bid. And that's what's kind of weird today. So I want to come back to that weirdness. Before that, I know you've been studying commodities in their relation to financial conditions. What have you found? Yeah, well, I decided to see if there was any historical precedent, right, to see if there was kind of this uh, previous times where you've seen commodity shocks really kind of strangle the market and then strangle the economy. And of course, we know the, the most common example is going to be in the 1970s when you had that, of course, that embargo and essentially the supply come off. But in more recent history, you've seen it happen in 2008. You saw it happen in 1991. And that's really, uh, for those of you who follow my chart of the day, that's what my chart of the day actually shows, that financial conditions tend to price in commodity shocks before they price in recessions. And 2008 is a really great example of that because if you'll remember, you had oil prices hit a record of as close to $150 a barrel. There was no war in sight. It was just purely inflation driven. And yet you saw financial conditions tighten. And this was before the collapse of Lehman Brothers, the collapse uh, that resulted in what we now know is the great financial crisis. So let me come back to that weirdness. As you yeah. The word you, word you used. Let me give the you an technical alternative, term. alternative hypothesis because you saw yesterday when the Fed announced what they announced initially, for example, the bond market, yields shot up. They've settled right back down again. Stocks have come back up. Is it possible that the markets basically just don't believe the Fed? They say, OK, you think you're going to get up to two and a quarter percent by the end of next year. We don't think you're going to get there. Yeah, it's totally a totally plausible thesis. But here's where it gets a little another technical term here, squirrely, right, <laughs> uh, is this idea that uh, you have had the market kind of price in 25 basis points for a while. So that initial drop that you saw yesterday off of those off of that announcement might have simply been I know this is a very cliche term, but buy the rumor, sell the news. And you did see that volatility going into the meeting. And then you saw that kind of bounce back come out. So one of the big questions here when it comes to the stock market in particular is, is the concerns about the commodity market and the oil market in particular still what's going to shake the market. But remember, we've dropped uh, far more than that 10 percent technical correction. I think we're down over 15 percent from year to date. So that really tells you that there is a lot of pain um, that's already kind of been had in the market. So a rally from here isn't all that abnormal. I at the same time, uh, we had what some people thought was sort of happy talk out of the Fed yesterday. Sure, they said, we're going to raise rates. We're going to raise them faster than we thought. But at the same time, it's not going to really affect the strength of the economy. It's going to affect unemployment. Uh, if that's right, the markets would be right to react affirmatively to that. What if it's wrong? Well, what's interesting about what they said was about unemployment was we have an extremely tight labor market. That's not something you say when you're celebrating uh, the labor market. So that's going to be something to watch. But to your point about the recession talk, remember going into the meeting, one of the big questions was demand destruction. Does it send the economy into a really rough spot? And right now, it doesn't seem like we're there. And essentially what you heard from Chairman Powell was, we still have a very strong economy. We still have very strong consumer spending. We have good housing starts, a good manufacturing sector. If you look at the data, the economy is actually doing very well. So what he's, I think, saying is that it can weather any kind of major hikes that you're seeing from the Federal Reserve and arguably, big, big question mark here, 
arguably any commodity shocks that come their way. Yeah, but don't be mistaken. I'm happy with a happy talk if it's right. Right. So I'm rooting for the Fed to be right. I just want to make sure we all that are. they are. <laughs> exactly. Thanks so much to Kriti Gupta for that report on where the markets are today. Coming up, we're going to talk with Max Baucus. He's the former U.S. ambassador to China and also former senator from Montana. We're going to talk to him about that meeting over the phone by President Xi and President Biden coming up tomorrow. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David West, and we want to keep you up to date with news from around the world. And for that, we turn to Mark Crumpton with First Word. Russia's words are not matching its actions as the U.S. continues to see heavy Russian bombardment of Ukrainian cities like Kharkiv. Kirby spoke with Bloomberg Television's Maria Tadeo at NATO headquarters in Brussels. What we have not seen, you know, the Russians for all the talk about wanting to find a diplomatic path forward, we haven't seen them act on that. The Kremlin says talks with Ukraine will continue today. China's foreign ministry has backed remarks made by its ambassador to Ukraine, who said China was a friendly country to Ukraine and would never attack it. That's according to a post on the government website of the Ukrainian city of Lviv. China has struggled to balance its diplomatic partnership with Russia with its history of supporting the sovereignty of independent nations. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson says he's optimistic that Saudi Arabia will pump more oil, but he couldn't give any assurances. The Prime Minister met with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Sultan in Riyadh. It's part of his campaign to end European reliance on Russian oil and gas. Residents in Fukushima, Japan and the surrounding region are cleaning up after an earthquake there on Wednesday killed at least four people and injured more than 100 others. The quake was a magnitude 7.4. That northern region is part of an area that was devastated by an earthquake and tsunami 11 years ago. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Thank you so much, Mark. We've been talking throughout the program about the fact that tomorrow President Biden is due to speak with President Xi of China, specifically about Ukraine as well as about other issues. This is something, of course, that the United States is very intent on, getting United to China not to side with Russia in the fight over Ukraine. We turn now to somebody who knows China terribly well. He's Max Baucus. He, of course, is the former U.S. ambassador to China, and for over 35 years, he represented his home state of Montana in the United States Senate. So, Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for being with us. Give us the perspective from President Xi right now of what he's facing here because he has the Ukrainian situation. It's not the only problem he's dealing with right now. Well, the good news here is uh, uh, that China wants stability. Uh, that's their long-term goal in their effort to achieve economic prominence of, um, in years ahead. They also would like this um, invasion in Ukraine to end because it's causing a lot of complications for them. Uh, the main one being that, um, that as it is kind of playing footsie, frankly, uh, with, with Russia and probably helping Russia a little bit. At the same time, the United States um, is telling Russia, excuse me, is telling China, if you aid uh, Russia, you're going to face uh, additional sanctions, uh, sanctions that we impose not only against Russia, but sanctions that we're probably going to impose against you. China clearly does not want that. So China is going to do what it can to keep talking to President Biden, to assure President Biden that, hey, we Chinese would like this to end too. And we're helping end it. Maybe we could play the role of the broker. The trouble, frankly, though, is that, that uh, uh, China's words are not really, um, um, as, their actions are not following their words, as is the case with Russia. So it's a very difficult situation. Well, to use your f term, they may be playing footsie right now. The question is, will they go beyond that? We talked with uh, Senator Pat Toomey of Pennsylvania earlier this week, and he said, just to quote him, he said, the idea of providing military aid would be madness for China. Do you agree with that, that it's unlikely that President Xi would take that kind of step to actually provide military aid? I, I agree with Senator Toomey. That would be madness. China's not going to do that. China wants stability. That's, that's their underlying concern. Uh, don't forget, they've got problems at home, too. Their economic problems. Uh, the, the COVID pandemic is right, right, raising its ugly head in China. Um, President Xi wants to be elected to a third term, so he wants to build. He will not send uh, military aid to Russia. There's no way he'll do that. There'll be other forms of aid, 
uh, perhaps food aid. Um, I, we see reports that um, Russian soldiers are not getting all the food they need. Um, I think China, as well as the rest of the world, is almost stunned at how unsuccessful President uh, Putin has been in his, his attempted invasion of Ukraine. It's, Putin's falling apart. The Russian forces are falling apart. So China will aid a little bit, but not too much. Don't forget, this gives China a lot of leverage over Russia, too. Russia is in a very diff, uh, vulnerable position. Uh, we all know that. Uh, China knows that. So uh, China could probably drive a pretty hard bargain with Russia, perhaps in terms of getting the, um, energy from Russia at cheaper prices. Putting yourself on that telephone call tomorrow between President Biden and President Xi, what other things do, does President Biden have in his toolkit, whether uh, beyond moral suasion to say it's the right thing to do? What about carrots and sticks, particularly, for example, with respect to trade? Well, um, so far, Biden has not relaxed the trade restrictions that President Trump imposed. And I don't think um, Biden's going to use that tool uh, this time either. On the other hand, um, he will say to, to President Xi, if you don't play ball here, if we see you helping Russia, um, we're going to probably impose additional sanctions, um, not only on Russia, but also on you, China. China does not want that. These sanctions um, are, are hurt on, on Russia are hurting uh, China as well. Although I might, I must say that um, on down the road, a major goal of China is, is more self-sufficiency. China does not like to depend upon other countries as much as it has in the past. And um, it's probably one reason why there's more decoupling going on in the world, um, different countries pursuing their own uh, points of view. So I think that the main uh, stick uh, Biden's going to use, is, hey, um, we, we're going to, there'll be sanctions, you're, you're going to get hurt more. And you don't, I'm sure you don't want that. So uh, I'm so glad, Mr. Ambassador, you raised that issue about not wanting to depend on others, because we saw, I think, a half step back by President Xi and the administration over there in saying, by the way, we've got to back off a little bit about the, uh, the really stringent regulation of tech, and we want to revisit the question of foreign investors in Chinese companies, something that for a while we thought maybe they don't care. It appears they do care. So are they a bit more dependent, at least at this point, than what President Xi had hoped for? Well, this doesn't totally answer your question, but China's working very hard to prevent the delisting of, of Chinese uh, uh, companies on U.S. stock exchanges, right, because of insufficient um, auditing uh, practices. Now, my understanding that in talking to the Chinese, and I've asked this question very much of them, of if the current um, timeline continues, that is, U.S. Uh, will not delist Chinese uh, companies that, on U.S. stock exchanges before 2024, if they don't uh, comply, that timeline is pursued that I think China will find a way during the next couple of years uh, to, to meet the conditions that it wants. My main point is that China wants economic ties, very much wants economic ties between yeah. U.S. and China. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador. Always great to have you with us as former ambassador to China, Max Baucus. We should mention that the stock market is at session highs. It's just up incrementally, but still it's at session highs right now. In the meantime, we're going to be talking next to former Secretary of Defense and head of the CIA. He's Mr. Leon Panetta on the U.S. posture in Ukraine. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. Welcome back. You're watching Balance of Power. Well, you could be listening to it on Bloomberg Radio. Let's talk a little bit about what is happening right now. European equity markets are closing down for the day. While we're seeing a rally over in the United States, it's quite a muted close here in Europe. So a little bit of green, not much green. The CAC Quarante in Paris up by around four tenths of one percent. The DAX is down a little bit, down by three tenths of one percent. But what we are seeing is the London market accelerating to the upside. There's two reasons why the FTSE is up today. One of which is that we're seeing a pickup in the price of Brent. So London has a lot of commodity stocks. It's benefiting from that. But we're also seeing the pound under pressure as well because the Bank of England today raised rates by 25 basis points, a bit like the Fed, but really put an emphasis on the growth slowdown that we're seeing here in the UK. And that may limit the number of rate hikes coming down the pike from the Bank of England. So that's the picture in terms of the map across Europe. Fairly muted. Some markets up, some markets down. In the aggregate, a fairly flat session. And you can see that on the next board, which is the stock 600. Uh, this is what we're looking at here. Stock 600, as you can see, rallying up into the end of the day, but only up by around four tenths of 1%. That's the impacts of the rally we're seeing in the United States. But we have retaken 450, 450, 28. 
Just want to show you some of those other assets quickly uh, while we're here talking about the impact that the British pound is having, what's happening with the dollar right now and that Brent story. So the British pound today absolutely flat, but versus other currencies where we've seen a rally for, for instance, the euro versus the dollar, it's interesting that the pound has been suppressed. So 131.57, that's down to the Bank of England. But elsewhere, we are seeing some pressure on the dollar today. You can see that in euro dollar, 111.13 for the single currency. But the real story is the bounce back we're seeing in commodities, Brent crude up by nearly 9%. In terms of the sector story, let's just kind of give you an idea of what is happening. As you might have guessed, we are seeing some of the energy names coming back. Top of the board, energy up by 2.07%. Bottom end of the market, retail, autos and the banks continuing to come under pressure here in Europe. Let's talk about some of the single names before I hand you back to David. EQT is Europe's largest listed private equity company. Today it announced a huge deal out in Asia, out in Asia, sorry, uh, bearing Asia, which is a very similar firm. It's the biggest private equity deal ever done between two private equity companies, i.e. one buying the other fascinating deal they see some real opportunities out in asia i was talking to christian sending a little bit earlier on the ceo huge opportunities tissen krupp one of the companies that could be having uh, uh, feeling the impact of the ukraine war uh, it was due to offload its steel business that may not now happen as a result of the the war in ukraine that stock down by 9.36 percent and ocado the technology grocery delivery company under pressure today because of input costs. It's feeling the inflation story. Consumers aren't buying as many groceries as well. And as a result of which, David, that stock being marked down by nearly 9% as well. David, back to you. Guy Johnson, thank you so much for that summary of the European closing. By the way, we're feeling a little inflation back here in the United States as well. I want to come back to the United States now and Congress. Obviously, Congress has been really focused on what's going on in Ukraine, including with that address, remarkable address yesterday from President Zelensky of Ukraine. Today, they've been marking up some possible sanctions legislation. We now welcome somebody who's an author of part of that legislation. He's Representative French Hill, Republican of Arkansas. He's a member of the Financial Services Committee. He also served as a senior level of the Treasury Department of George Herbert Walker Bush and himself was a banker at one point. So, Representative, thank you so much for being with us. Explain what part of the sanctions you're responsible for and where does it stand now? Well, David, it's great to be with you. Yes, since the summer of 2020, I've been advocating that we not expand special drawing rights by the IMF. And uh, the reason is because it benefits uh, countries like America that don't need additional reserve assets. And it helps our enemies like China and Russia. So today we voted up uh, a bill in our uh, committee that would uh, prohibit the IMF from issuing any special drawing rights as a reserve assets to the central banks at Belarus and Russia. It would prevent uh, any loans from the IMF being made to those two countries. And it would encourage the treasury to make sure every IMF member, including China, not facilitate using SDRs as collateral or exchanging them for a hard currency or the RMB. Do you have any guess about when there might be actual action enactment of this bill? Well, there's no doubt that Treasury is pursuing this as a strategy, but we plan on voting on this committee, getting it out of committee today in the House, and I hope it gets to the floor soon. Uh, the Democrats and Republicans in the House are united in taking financial steps to counter uh, Putin's aggression. Congressman, obviously Ukraine is, is, is at the top of the list, but also, of course, we have the issues surrounding Fed with their announcement yesterday of their decision and some projections. As I say, you were both a Treasury official and a banker, so you're particularly qualified to address this. What did you make of what we heard from the Federal Reserve yesterday? Well, you witnessed the anguish of central banking, as described by Arthur Burns, a former Fed chairman back in 1979, when you're confronted with uh, fiscal policies that are too stimulative, like we have in the United States under the Biden administration, and too accommodative a Federal Reserve position. In other words, we're buying uh, treasuries and we're keeping interest rates too low. This is a real challenge when you face a 10% increase in producer price increases and a CPI that's just under 10%. So that is in truth, a truth the, the anguish of central banking. Had I been a member of the FOMC yesterday, I think I would have supported a 50, a 50 basis point increase in the short term rates. They agreed to a 25 basis point increase and many more plan this year. We're behind the curve in fighting inflation at the Fed and we need to catch up. At the same time, in their economic projections they made, they said we can raise the rates uh, despite inflation, despite uh, diminishing growth and not affect unemployment. Is that plausible? 
Uh, avoiding a recession in this circumstance uh, with the uh, commodity shock of oil and gas prices and rising interest rates will be challenging. That's why the Board of Governors and the FOMC earn the big money to carry this burden. Uh, so I wish them well. I hope we have a, self land, a safe uh, and uh, safe landing of that, a soft landing, I should say, uh, but it remains to be seen. We're, we're behind the curve and that makes it tougher. Uh, finally, we did have action in committee over the Senate side with respect to those uh, five nominees, at least four of the nominees, I should say, because one of them has withdrawn her name uh, for the Federal Reserve. One of the key positions and the one that actually uh, we had the nominee withdraw from is supervision. Uh, you were a banker. You were a treasury. Uh, are we disadvantaged by not having that vice chair position filled? Yes, I think the Biden administration should nominate an experienced policymaker for the vice chairman for supervision that has our economy uh, first on their minds and how to make sure that America stays innovative and that we keep all the regulators on the same page and that they focus on their statutory mission. And their statutory mission does not include trying to set climate policy at the bank regulators. And I think that was a real detriment to the president's first nominee. I wish him well on selecting somebody that can get quickly confirmed by the Senate. Well, let me just pursue that a moment, if I could, given your background. We tend to focus on things like the climate issue and regulation. It's sort of a bigger, more uh, attractive issue to focus on. There's a lot of plumbing that needs to get done, isn't there, with the Fed? I mean, are we backing up here, if you're a bank, just getting some answers to some questions? Right. The Federal Reserve is essential to keeping all the regulators on the same page. We're in disarray, for example, on a, a consolidated new rulemaking on the Community Reinvestment Act. Our big companies are subject to uh, prudential regulation by the Fed. They want somebody to talk to, somebody that can help set policy. And we need to make sure that our policies are kept in sync and competitive uh, as we are in a global industry. And finally is the issue of uh, a bank consolidation and bank startups. That's another reason why we need to have forward-looking, market-oriented regulators that can assess what the right direction is for the whole industry. And finally, let me ask the tricky question here. Uh, but really, since I have you, I'm really curious. We're seeing inflation. There needs to be some curtailing of inflation. That's what the Fed's trying to do. Is there a potential role for Congress in increasing some taxes someplace to take some of the froth out of the economy? Well, look, the right way to tackle economy, uh, the, the inflation issue, it's a monetary event. So we need to have the Fed begin to shrink its balance sheet, raise interest rates consistent with their mandate of price stability. And we need to have Congress not spending money recklessly in an untargeted way, which we've done since the pandemic. Finally, we need to make sure that our regulatory system unleashes American energy industry so that they can produce uh, more here, get back up to 13 million barrels a day. That'll help keep the pressure off our gas prices our families are facing. And let's take regulatory burdens off the things that keep people from hiring new truck drivers or new workers. So if we do all those things, we can help uh, lower inflationary expectations and get our country back to work to full employment without uh, this uh, in terrible inflation we're facing now. Congressman, always so good to talk with you. Thank you for your time. Thanks, David. That's Representative French Hill, Republican of Arkansas. Coming up, we're going to talk with former Secretary of Defense Le Leon Panetta on the war in Ukraine and possible paths forward. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. their superior knowledge of the terrain and their own geography, as well as uh, the, their nimble behavior in terms of using these, these systems they're getting quite effectively. And they have essentially stalled the Russian advance. That was Pentagon Press Secretary Rear Admiral John Kirby speaking exclusively with Mar Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo overnight in Brussels. Joining us now is Leon Panetta of the Panetta Institute for Public Policy. Mr. Patena, ben Panetta, of course, served as President Obama as his Secretary of Defense and Director of the CIA and was President Clinton's Chief of Staff. So, Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for being with us. You heard what John Kirby had to say there. What's your take on what's going on? Are the Russians essentially stalled? And if so, do you think that Vladimir Putin might be looking for an off-ramp? Well, there's no question that uh, Putin and his invasion are in trouble. Uh, and he's, uh, he's increasingly uh, isolating himself uh, in many ways. First of all, uh, his, his own army is not performing 
uh, up to uh, what I think Putin expected. He thought uh, within a few days they'd capture the capital, uh, the government would go down, and Russia would be in control, and that's not happening. Uh, there are a lot of problems in the Russian army on leadership, on command and control. Uh, their people are not fighting uh, the way they should. They're not trained as well as we thought they were. Uh, so his army's in trouble. He's got problems in Russia. Uh, his speech yesterday kind of attacking his own people, uh, for those who uh, supported Ukraine, uh, tells you that uh, he's worried about the support that he's getting within Russia itself in terms of the war. And add to that the sanctions and what's happening with his economy. Uh, he is isolated. And so the question then becomes, uh, when somebody's in trouble, what happens? I think intelligence probably came out with the best analysis. He's going to try to double down. And I think that's what you're seeing. He's going to double down. He's going to keep uh, trying to destroy these cities. He's going to try to use whatever power he has. But the bottom line is that I don't believe Putin can win this war because uh, he can destroy cities. He can win cities but he can't destroy and win the hearts and minds of the Ukrainian people. Let me ask you, Mr. Secretary, about that intelligence, because, of course, you were not only Secretary of Defense, you were also Director of the CIA. Uh, to what extent do we have intelligence about Mr. Putin and his inner circle? Have we learned from this anything about him? Do we have any degree of confidence about how he's making decisions? I, I, I think without question, uh, Putin is increasingly isolated. Uh, he, he really... He has a few people around him. Uh, they're the ones uh, that are largely puppets, very frankly. Uh, there's nobody uh, of quality that uh, can really provide uh, effective guidance to Putin. So he's pretty much making these decisions on his own. Uh, and uh, because, you know, when, when you're a bully and you're in a corner, uh, bullies will strike out. And I think that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to find a way to try to achieve uh, some some parts of his mission. I mean, you asked about whether he would agree to an off-ramp on negotiations. Uh, I know they're negotiating. They seem to be making progress. Uh, but my sense from talking to people in the Pentagon and elsewhere is that they're very worried that the Russians uh, are simply going to use that as an excuse to rebuild their forces uh, and continue the offensive. So I think we've got to be careful. I think the only way to basically deal with Putin right now is to double down ourselves, which means to provide as much military aid as necessary to the Ukrainians so that they can continue the battle against the Russians. Does that mean supplying military aid almost without regard to provocation? I mean, we actually talked with former <laughs> Defense Secretary uh, William Cohen yesterday. He said, you know what, don't talk to me about provoking when they're destroying all those civilian places. Should we be worried about going too far in provoking Russia? Well, it's a little bit uh, difficult to uh, try to be careful when somebody's beating the hell out of you uh, and uh, not respond. And that's what's going on. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think uh, we are engaged in a conflict here. Uh, it's a proxy war with uh, Russia, whether we say so or not. Uh, that effectively is what's going on. Uh, and for that reason, we've got to make sure we're providing as much weaponry as possible to give the Ukrainians the ability to continue what is a very courageous fight. Uh, I mean, they're, they're putting their lives on the line. They're fighting uh, as well as uh, any units that uh, I've seen in, in my time uh, working with uh, defense issues. These are good fighters. Uh, they're small unit operations. They're working well. Uh, and I, I think ultimately uh, the key here is for the Ukrainians to carry this battle to the Russians. The Russians have stalled. I think John Kirby is right. The Russians have stalled. And in war, uh, there's no such thing as uh, just kind of holding the line. You're either moving forward or you're moving backward. And I think right now the Russians are taking it pretty hard from the Ukrainians. Uh, finally, Mr. Secretary, what about some help from some third party? We now know that President Biden will speak with President Xi of China tomorrow. There's also talk perhaps about the Turks getting involved. Is it possible for either China or Turkey to really bring the parties together and maybe move forward? Well, obviously, I think all of those uh, diplomatic uh, options ought to be pursued. Uh, I think uh, we ought to try to be uh, working with the Turks. I think we ought to be trying to work with uh, uh, with China to try to exert as much influence as possible 
uh, on Russia. I know uh, Israel is trying to work at this as well. Uh, there are other third parties that are trying to work at this. Uh, I think we need to explore that, but make no mistake about it. Uh, diplomacy is going nowhere unless we have leverage, unless the Ukrainians have leverage. And the way you get leverage is by, frankly, uh, going in and killing Russians. That's what uh, the Ukrainians have to do. We've got to continue the war effort because that this is a power game. Putin understands power. Uh, he really doesn't understand diplomacy very much. He understands power. And the only way to convince Putin that this is not going anywhere and that he should take some kind of off-ramp is to continue to beat him on the battlefield. Thank you so much for your perspective. It's so valuable. That's the former Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta, from the Panetta Institute. Coming up, what we learned about the economy from the Fed yesterday. And for that matter, what we learned about the Fed itself. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio.